is open to the book of Acts in chapter 1. Would you like to open yours to the same passage with me, the passage that Jeff read from? We're going to sort of work through that this morning. There was a philosopher over 2,000 years ago that said something like this. He said, every new beginning comes from some other beginning's end. Well, we started this new series last week about a new beginning. We're calling it Back to the Start. And we learned last week how after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the disciples had sort of gone on shutdown. They locked themselves behind closed doors. They were on pause. They were full of anxiety, full of fear. It ruled the day. But then Jesus conquered the grave. He appeared to them and basically said, let's have a new beginning. Let's go back to the start. And this morning we're going to discover that one of the acts that they returned to was the practice of real, heartfelt, devoted prayer. A few years ago, several years ago, there was a magazine by the this week that asked the question of its readers. The question was this, what's the matter you'd like to hear most about when you attend your church service? And the number one answer they received was this answer, how to have a more effective prayer life. Now, Jesus in his ministry, back in the Gospels, Matthew through John, gave us several practical guidelines concerning praying. He said, pray to your Father who is in heaven. Father, he would begin the prayers. Uh, Pray in my name, in Jesus' name. Jesus is our advocate, our go-between. He said, when you pray, just sincerely pour out your heart. There's not a form or a certain set of special words. Just tell your Father what's on your mind. I like to think of it in terms of when you get a a card from somebody, there's that pre-printed message in the card, but then often they'll write some personal note or two at the bottom. And what is your eyes drawn to first, or what means the most to you? Is that that pre-printed poem, or is it the personal message that they've scribbled in? And I think our Father in Heaven is, is the same when it comes to that. God's wanting to see that message from our heart as well. He's not looking for form or ritual or a bunch of these and thous, just what's on your heart. And so the Bible's not full necessarily of definitions of prayer as it is descriptions of people who have prayed, just pouring out their hearts to God. And the disciples at the start of the book of Acts here, I think are a tremendous example of this. They had prayed with Jesus. Remember, some of them had been in the Garden of Gethsemane that night that Jesus prayed and had for a while before they went to sleep maybe prayed with him. They'd heard Jesus tell story after story about prayer, but now they got back to devoting themselves to heartfelt prayer, prayer that led to God's awesome outpouring of his power just 10 days later in chapter 2 in what would be the birthday of the church. So as the people of God, As the church, we desperately need, I think, to get back to really getting serious about prayer. And this example from the lives of the disciples in Acts chapter 1, I think, gives us four principles that can enable us to do just that. So let's let's dig into this. If you've got your bulletin, you can follow along on the outline. Here's the first principle that we see here. They prayed obediently. Before we pray, let's obey. Remember what Jesus had said to him back in verse 4 in the text? He gave them this command. He said, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father's promised. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. Now, they're doing exactly what Jesus told them to do. Verse 12, the disciples leave where Jesus was with them right after he ascended back into heaven, the Mount of Olives, and they walk back into the city of Jerusalem, and there they stay. As if to say, now we're going to pray, but the first thing we're going to do is do exactly what Jesus told us to do. There's this passage of Scripture in 1 John chapter 3, verse 21 and 22. My dear friends, if our hearts don't make us feel guilty, we can come without fear into God's presence. And God gives us what we ask for because we obey his commands and we do what pleases him. So if you're going to pray, if you're going to pray for God, for instance, to, let's say, bless your relationship with this person, be committed to living out that relationship with the parameters of God. You know, 1 Peter chapter 3 says that when a husband and wife are in conflict with one another, um, and, and they're not obeying God in the harmony in their relationship, then their prayers are, it's going to be a, a barrier to their prayers in their prayer life. And likewise, I think of two unmarried people are just living together uh, and, and they're, they're praying to God, they need to consider the fact that 
that God has a, a, an area of their life that they want to get right there in, in coming together in, in marriage. If we want to, God to honor our relationships, let's first live in that relationship in a way that honors him. Maybe I say, God, bless my job, bless my finances, make the decision that you're going to be a good steward and do, what he, uh, do, do honorably with what he's blessed you with. Put him first in your giving. Give God the first fruits. Don't hoard. Honor him with what he places into your hand. Why would God bless me with more, see, if I'm just going to waste it or hoard it or, or blow it? Maybe I say, God, bless my health. Then remember, the Bible says, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Honor God with your body, it says. So don't abuse it. Don't put stuff in it that's going to destroy it. Take care of it. In other words, don't say, for instance, Pray for me, I have sugar while gulping a cream horn that you follow up with a French vanilla cappuccino from Tim Hortons. You see what I'm saying here? If we're going to pray something, let's live in accordance with the way that we're praying. Why should God honor the request we're making if we're going to dishonor him with the way that we live? Years ago, there was a man by the name of E.M. Baldwin that lived, and he had a great quote about prayer. He said this, if you throw a boat hook from the boat and you catch hold of the shore, do you pull the shore to you, or do I pull myself to the shore? Now, picture God as the shore. Prayer is not pulling God to my will, but it's aligning my will to the will of God. There was this church member and a preacher. They were golfing together one day, and before successfully one putting each hole, the church member would take off his hat on the green, put it over his heart, and he'd say a prayer, and he won one putt. The preacher was continually taking two or three putts to get in the hole. About the fifth, sixth hole, he said, you know what? I think I'm going to try that. They got up to the green. The preacher had a long putt, took off his hat, put it over his heart, bowed his head, said a prayer, and he continued to, to three-putt the hole. He couldn't believe what's going on here. So he said to his buddy, why doesn't prayer work for me like it works for you? And the church member said, well, it doesn't mean a thing if you can't putt. And so I think there's some good theology there. There has to be a consistency between how we live and what we do and how we pray. Am I aligned with God's target for my life, or am I, am I doing this? So here's a couple of questions as we get back into praying here. The first one, is there an area of my life that is out of step of the will of God? We pray too often for God to make everything right and too infrequently that we'll first be right. Praying, expecting God to answer us while we're contented to live a life of rebellion and disobedience is sort of like this. It's like a husband's wife being unfaithful and then her expecting him to finance the affair. The Bible calls us the bride of Christ. The least our groom deserves is our faithfulness. But here's a second question we can ask. Can my prayer find its biblical footing? In other words, is what I want for me what Jesus would want for me? Am I willing to submit my will to God's will? Here's the thing. A good place to start when it comes to having a more effective prayer life is when you feel like your prayers are not getting any higher than the ceiling is first of all, not look up, but first of all, look within. Start with you. The psalmist put it like this. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. We've said it so many times throughout the years. God won't heal what we conceal, what we bury, what we hide. So is there some issue, some habit, some sin, some lifestyle blocking the blessing of God in my life? Is there something I need to break with, some person I need to go talk to, some step of faith I need to take to get myself aligned with God's will for my life? Now, we go back here to Acts chapter 1, just verses 12 to 14. See, a second principle that sort of leaps out at us. They prayed persistently with intensity. I like that phrase in verse 14. They all joined together constantly in prayer, one version says. The word constantly in the original language that the Bible was written in here carries with it the idea of persistence over a period of time. They stayed at it. The same word is used in Acts chapter 6, verse 4, where it says they gave attention to prayer. So there's some seriousness. The idea is persistency, intensity. They were seriously committed to the act of prayer. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says they devoted themselves to prayer. And there comes this connection between how the church prayed and what God does in their midst. And you see it throughout the early pages of the book of Acts. You see it in chapter 1. You see it in chapter 2. Chapter 4, they have a prayer meeting. You know what happens? You go home and read it today. The whole building is shaken and lives are brought to the Lord. In chapter 13, they pray Peter's in jail and an earthquake sets him free. So throughout the book, there seems to be this connection in the acts that God performs and the persistent asking of his people and what they do. Someone might come up to me every once in a while and, and ask me to 
pray about an issue in their life, and I'm happy to do that. But you know what my first thought is? My first question is, are you praying about this? Well, yeah. Okay, how often? How hard? How much? Once a day? Once a week? Maybe just maybe sometimes the hand of God hasn't moved because he may be just wanting to know, hey, Mark, how serious are you about this thing that you say is so important to you? How hard are you praying? Do you remember Abraham praying for God to spare the city of Sodom, clear back in the book of Genesis? And Abraham says, God, God, if, you see, if there's 50 righteous, will you spare them? And God says, yes. And then Abraham starts working himself down. If 45 righteous, and God says, yes, I'll spare it. And then he goes, 40, 30, 20, God, if there's just 10 righteous in the city, and God says, yes, 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 I'll spare it. And then Abraham quit asking. He stopped asking. And when he stopped asking, though, God had still been saying yes. Jesus said, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. Do you ever, do you ever bob for apples when you were a kid? Ever bob for apples? Anybody ever? Now, don't give me that sanctified look this morning like you never did anything like that when you were a kid. You know, you get that, you got your head down in there and it gets all, your hair gets wet and you're trying to bite that apple in that, that tub of water and, and then you're down and up and then you're back down and then you're back up unless you got a friend that's helping you and he kind of keeps your head down in there, you know. And, and, but that's the way it is. And you're in and you're out and you're up and you're down. And I think some people pray the way that they bob for apples. They hit and miss. They're quickly in and out with God. They don't stay very long, and they don't do it very often. They may try a couple of times, but then they quit. No consistency, no persistence. Here's a question for you in your prayers. Have I devoted myself to praying about this every single day? Meaningful prayer asks as much of the one who prays as it does of the God who answers. God's waiting to see, are you really serious about this? You see, we want to microwave our prayers. God wants us to crock pot them. There's this biblical principle at work in prayer. It's when prayer is most persistent that prayer becomes most productive. Jesus told stories about it, didn't he? Luke chapter 18, he said there's this widow who comes before a judge and she's seeking justice and she keeps asking, she keeps pleading, she keeps coming back again and again and finally the judge grants her her request. Why did Jesus tell the story? He said in the very first verse, here's why. He told this disciples, this parable, this story to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Someone wrote the words, you are coming to a king. Large petitions with you bring for his wealth and power are such you can never ask too much. Listen, friend, if God's your partner, you ought to make your plans big. You ought to make your prayers big. Jesus had told them, fellas, you're going to take this gospel message back in what, verse 5, 6, 7, and 8. You're going to take this gospel message all across the world. I'd say that's pretty big. So after Jesus throws that out there, what do you think they're praying about here? Since Jesus told them the ends of the earth, this is where you're going, what do you think they're praying about in this meeting? Sunshine for the church picnic? Maybe John had pulled a muscle running to the tomb on Easter Sunday. Well, we want to remember Brother John. He's still nursing his leg. Or maybe it was somebody who knew somebody who heard about somebody who was in the Jerusalem Memorial Hospital. Huh? Now, I think back to some of the prayer meetings I've been a part of in 40 years in the ministry, and I'm not trying to be critical. or, or you know, I'm, just, I'm just stating some fact here. It, it, it's, it, it comes to request time, and it's like a contest or something sometimes. Somebody throws one out, and then somebody feels like they got to top that one, and then somebody's got to top the one that's just, a, and then you, need, you have this ladder that's a, a, a going up here to, to, to see who can have the, the, the greatest prayer request sometimes. Someone said, we spend more time praying to keep saints out of heaven than saints out of sin and sinners out of hell. It's perfectly fine to pray for the health of people. Certainly, we should do that. But prayer has to go farther and deeper than that. If our biggest prayer need is that God will keep our post-toasties from becoming soggy while we quickly bow our heads in our morning prayer, our prayers are just a little too puny. Here's what Jesus had said. Here's what I think they prayed about. Verse 8 of chapter 1. You're going to receive power and the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. And I've said before, that's sort of an outline for the book of Acts there. You have Jerusalem. That's like a short-range goal. That would happen in a few days in chapter 2. What do you need to pray long and hard about between now and the next few weeks? Now and the end of the year. Okay? Think of it that way. Judea and Samaria would be like intermediate 
range goals. That would take three to four years. Jerusalem's chapter 1 to 7 in Acts. Judea and Samaria, the gospel goes uh, uh, into those places in chapters 8 through 12. So what do you want your life to look like, your relationship with God, your family to look like three years from now? Start praying about it every day. And then the ends of the earth, that was a long-range goal. That would take about 30 years, by the way. Three decades later in Colossians chapter 1, verse 6, it says the gospel's gone into all the world. So when I think about that, I think, what legacy do I want to leave behind? How do I want to finish up? How would you want your tombstone to read? What would you want people to say about you? Pray about it. Now get this, there's some pretty big plans for a group of guys that chapter 4 and verse 13 calls this, unschooled, ordinary, uneducated men. That's what these apostles were. You know what that tells me? It tells me Jesus is saying, if you're going to be part of my church, you better make your plans big. The dry run church of Christ need to attempt things, take steps of faith that are so big, the only way we can accomplish them is by the power of God. So the apostles are praying here. Jesus, you're a great God with great plans. Now do something great through us. Bruce Wilkinson wrote uh, several books. In one of his books, he talks about a time he had taken his preschool son several years ago, David, to the park. David watched some of the older kids going up and down a huge slide. You know how some of the slides are for the older kids, some are for the younger ones. But he's seeing this huge slide there, and they're having a great time. And so the slide, though, it was for the bigger kids. David thought, preschool David thought he would try it for himself. And he got about a third of the way up the ladder, and he froze right there. One of the bigger kids from behind him started yelling, get going, get going. But David's frozen in fear, and he can't go up or down. And Bruce Wilkinson rushes over and, and, and hollered at his son, David, are you okay? And he's just shaking, and he's clinging to that ladder. And little David asked his dad a surprising question. He said, Dad, will you, will, you, will you go down the slide with me? And he says, well, why, son? He said, I can't do it without you, Dad. He's still trembling. It's too big for me. And Wilkinson said, we climbed that ladder all the way to the top. I put my son on my lap. I wrapped my arms around him. We went zipping down the slide together, laughing all the way. Now, prayer is saying, Father, will you do this with me? I can't do it alone. It's too big for me. Then when you step out in faith and you discover that your heavenly Father's beside you and with you, the sky's the limit. The apostles prayed constantly with intensity, persistently. Now, there were 50 days from Passover feast to the Feast of Pentecost. Passover feast, now that was the time Jesus died and resurrected from the grave. Pentecost would be when the church would begin. 50 days, all right? Let me give you three things to pray about over this 50-day period. 50 days from now, I think, is right around October 25th. So I was thinking, what's some things that we can pray about in the next 50 days? Here's three. Three people that you know who don't yet know Jesus. He said here in verse 8, you will be my witnesses. Just a witness does just what? Just tells what they know. We aren't the judge. God is. We're not the prosecuting attorney. The Holy Spirit is. We're just people telling other people about Jesus, who he is, what he's done in our life. Jesus said to a guy one time, just tell the great things the Lord's done for you. Has God done anything in your life? Is there three people over the next 50 days, if God would give you the opportunity and you'd pray that God would give you the opportunity, you could just tell somebody what great thing God's done in your life. Anybody can do that. Two, the person on either side of you. Now, this morning, we're kind of spotty out here. So what I want you to do is pick out two people, not part of your family. Maybe they're on the right or the left, or maybe you have to go a few rows over or whatever. If you don't know them, go over and introduce yourself to them after the service and ask, is there anything I can pray about for you? If you're too shy to do that, pick out that person, that name, pray that God will bless their family, their home, their marriage, their kids over the next 50 days. And then one, one step of faith God wants you to take over the next 50 days. Something that requires somewhat of a leap. Something that's a little bigger than what you've usually been doing. Something maybe so big, unless God is in it, you're not going to pull it off. A big-minded prayer to a big-handed God. Something God wants to do starts with somebody just like you. Can we pray those three things over the next 50 days? Now, here's what they also did in prayer. They prayed in unity. I love this. When I read verse 12, 13, 14, there's a variety of different people here. Look at the people in this meeting. Look back to your Bible. You have men, women, the apostles, the brothers of the Lord who used to be unbelievers, but now because of the resurrection, they believe in Jesus. You got Mary, the mother of Jesus, mentioned there. You got Matthew, one of the 12, who used to work for the Roman government. He was a tax collector. Simon the Zealot, who's one of the 12, who used to work against the Roman government. He was an insurrectionist. 
I mean, this group could have been at each other's throats. They could have criticized Peter for being cowardly in his betrayal of Jesus the night before he goes to the cross. Peter could have blamed John because it was John who brought him that night to the high priest's house the night that all that betrayal happened. You know, we always like to blame somebody else for our wrongdoing, right? John could have turned everybody off by bragging that he was the only one who stayed at the cross while the rest of them fled. And the women could have nagged the men by reminding them that they were the ones who had to tell the men about the empty tomb and how none of them had believed the women, right? And just a few weeks before, if you look back in the Gospels, the disciples are arguing about who's the greatest when Jesus is ready to go to the cross. But now, verse 14 says, they all met together and they were constantly united. What united them? What brought them together? Prayer. You know something I've discovered? A little thing along the way. It's hard to fight with somebody that you're praying for. I think a good question to ask would be, why or who do I need to come together with so that we can both come before the Father? You know, last week I mentioned about one of the Charlie Brown cartoons. Let me give you another one. All right. Lucy comes in the room, and she just proceeds to change the channel on the TV that Linus, Linus is watching. And Linus protests and says, what gives you the right to march in here and take over my TV? And Lucy threatens Linus with her fist. Lucy says, these five fingers, individually, they're nothing. But when I curl them together like this into a single unit, they have awesome power. <laughs> Linus quickly gives in. And then as she exits, the last scene has him looking at his fingers and he says, why can't you guys get organized like that, you know? That's the power of unity. We already said there's 50 days from Passover, the, the time of the, the death and resurrection of Jesus, until Pentecost when the church begins. But if you go back to verse 4 here in Acts chapter 1, you'll see that Jesus had been appearing over a period of 40 days. So 50 minus 40 leaves 10. 10 days till the day of Pentecost, the events in Acts chapter 2, the birthday of the church, the coming of the Holy Spirit. So on your way out today, what I did this week is I just put together... Not only, you know, the 50-day thing, how about a 10-day? Just 10 days united together, this unity in prayer, 10 things that we can all pray about. Here's day one, day two. All of us praying about the same things for the next 10 days. And I think, you know what, if we did that and we got serious about that, what the hand of God just might do. Does our church need prayer right now? Huh? Oh, yeah. Does your family need prayer? Does our nation need prayer right now? Are you gripped with fear like the disciples, weary and anxious? Why don't you go home and get together with someone, maybe someone over here or someone over here. Maybe you contact them, you see them before you leave today, or maybe you get together with them with a text or whatever, and maybe you get on your phone. You know, those, those, some of the phones we can now do, you know, several people talking together on the same call, and, and we have a prayer time together, or we get together here at the church building, or we meet at a coffee shop or something like that, just three or four Right now in life, it's hard to stand. So maybe we need to kneel. My favorite physical posture of a child is this one. I love that when a little one does. Don't you love that? Your child, your grandchild. They reach up. It's when they're tired and they don't have the strength to go on by themselves. But they believe somehow, some way, you're strong enough to carry them. Parents love that. Your father loves that too. He loves it when you come to him, arms extended in prayer and say, Father, I can't, but you can. He wants to carry that burden for you and with you. And then when I look at these guys and the way they prayed, I, I, I really believe they prayed expectantly. Jesus had promised the Holy Spirit. He said, stay here in Jerusalem until he comes. And so they prayed based on God's promise. Now, here's the thing. They didn't really know what they were praying for yet. Jesus had told them a little bit about the Holy Spirit, but they had no idea. When you go and read chapter 2, I don't think they had any idea, you know, the tongues of like fire descending upon them and the, what God would do, 3,000 people being baptized. I, can you just imagine the conversation? You know, how much longer do we have to pray, Peter? I don't know. How are we going to know when the Holy Spirit comes? I don't know. What if the Holy Spirit comes and we don't know it? I don't know. All I know is Jesus said it. I believe it, so let's pray. They didn't know all the details yet. They just knew that Jesus somehow, some way, was going to use their lives for his glory. I think here's a prayer to pray for the next season in your life. Lord, as I wait on you to lead. See, like they, they had to wait. 
Help me to find the way you want to use my life in your kingdom right now for your glory. And then expect God will answer that prayer somehow, some way. But that's just it, isn't it? We pray, and when we pray, do we really expect God's going to show up to answer? Do we really believe this really matters? Jeremiah 33, verse 3 says it like this. Call to me, and I'll answer you, and I'll show you great and mighty things which you do not know. But do I really believe that? Now, I ask that hesitantly because there's some people who have this picture of God as the great vending machine in the sky. You just throw the prayer in, 50 cents worth of prayer. You pull the lever, and God gives you whatever you've asked for. There's a theology out there, name it and claim it, or I like to call it gab it and grab it, all right? But let's say you're planning a getaway for your family. Let's say to Virginia Beach, just an extended weekend. You've got like four days, okay? And it's a quick getaway. You pile the kids in the car. You start heading down the road. You get on the turnpike there uh, in Charleston. You've got it all planned out. You make a stop maybe an hour south of Charleston at the Tamarack. Um, and you fill up. And you, know, you get a little bite to eat there real quick, a little fast food. And uh, you're going to get back in the car. You've got a few hours to go to get to the beach. And suppose at that first stop, though, you have a 9-year-old in the back seat who says, Billy's family went to Cancun for their vacation. I don't want to go to Virginia Beach. I want to go to Cancun. Now, he can whine and plead and beg, but that request isn't going to be answered affirmatively regardless of how badly he wants it, right? Going to Cancun is not in his best interest at the time. You've only got four days. You have to turn around, go back and buy tickets you can't afford. You maybe only get to spend a day down there. It's not in his best interest, and it's definitely not in your budget. So regardless of how much he begs and pleads, the answer is no. I think that's like our prayers sometimes. Someone said one time, God answers prayer four ways. Yes, no, wait, and the fourth one is, you got to be kidding me. Huh? I just wonder if sometimes God wants to say, there's times that some of our prayer requests to our Father in heaven might be like a little nine-year-old wanting to head for Cancun just for the weekend. It's lacking in wisdom and knowledge, and it's immature. There's maybe a little selfishness involved. And even though a nine-year-old maybe can't fully understand why, it's still a no because the dad can see and knows what the child is too immature to understand. Can we, can we get this? Listen, your father sees farther than you do. Your father knows more than you do. Your father loves you more than you'll ever comprehend. God's like the father who says, I'm not always going to give you what you want, but I'll give you what is best. See, there's times, James chapter 4, verse 3 puts it like this, when we ask, we don't get what we want because the motives are wrong. We only want, want what will give us pleasure. Now, by the way, the disciples had already received a no. Did you know that? Back in verse 6, Jesus, they said, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And what we talked about last week, they were thinking an earthly throne there in Jerusalem. Jesus sets up his power there. They wipe out the Romans. They return to the glory days of David and Solomon. Jesus, are you going to do that? And Jesus answers, No. That's not the kingdom I'm talking about. Jesus saw a kingdom his children could not yet see, one that would go all the way around the world. So the answer was no, but now they're still asking, they're still praying, and with each prayer there's a, there's a sense of anticipation. That, 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 it's pregnant with hope. The air is electric. Jesus has promised God's going to do something big. So let me say it again. When you pray, pray knowing that God will not always do what you want, but he will do what is best. And you never have to be afraid of God's answer. Do you know that? God will always give his best to those who leave the choice with him. Too often we expect God to change our circumstances while he's using our circumstances sometimes to change us. So apostles, no, there's no throne I'm setting up here in Jerusalem. But Peter, John, James, Andrew, listen, listen, guys. You'll take my kingdom, my rule, my love all the way around the world. In other words, he's saying my answer is bigger than your request. Now get that. Sometimes God's answer is bigger than our request. So you ought to pray with the expectation that God's going to show up and do something big, something bigger than what I've asked for. So here's a question to ask whenever you pray. Do I really expect God to show up? Do I? Or am I just going through some motions here? Have you ever noticed how many people have collections of different things? I went into the home of one lady one time who had a collection of Beanie Babies from the ceiling to the floor. 
if you came to our if you come to our house you'd see just inside our front door glass cabinet there's a collection of precious moment figurines sherry's collected dozens over the years go to my mom and dad's house my dad likes to collect coffee cups he has cabinets full of these coffee cups from all over the united states now some people who collect they're not just into collecting they just may be willing to sell right for the right price but all this got me to thinking about whether or not God collects anything. I mean, is there anything in the universe that he saves? If you were to go to the place where God inhabits, if you went to his house, what would he show you on his shelf or what precious collection is in his trophy case? The book of Revelation gives us a glimpse of heaven. And in the book of Revelation, it foretells a scene where the 24 elders, they call them, fall at the feet of Jesus and they each have these golden bowls. And what's inside each of these bowls is so fragrant to Jesus. In fact, he's been saving these bowls. It's his collection. But it's not the bowls. It's what's inside the bowls that's so fragrant. Revelation 5, verse 8 tells us, they took the golden bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. What a word picture. What must prayer be to God that he keeps them, he collects them? When you pray to God and utter words to him, those words are kept because they're of such value to your father. What size of a bull would it take for God to hold all the prayers offered by the members of this church? By you over the last month? You know, I wonder if God measures success more so by offered prayers than by church attendance. I wonder if there are some churches right now that are much smaller than us that maybe could fill a bigger bowl than we do. If you're a Christian, if you're a child of God, somehow God sees you as a saint and he saves your heartfelt murmurs to him. Just picture that. And those bowls are his prized possession. His bowls are filled with prayers whispered by, I don't know, a recovering alcoholic, a suffering sister, the words spoken from a grief-stricken widow, the struggling mom and dad with their kids, the grateful words of a sinner who has experienced forgiveness, None of your prayers have escaped his notice, and he wouldn't sell them for anything. After all, after all, he paid a lot to hear from you. It cost him the life of his very own son on the cross. And if you haven't already come into his family and accepted Jesus as Savior, if you haven't moved from just being a creation of God to a child of God who can say, Father, we invite you today to come and get right with the Savior. The Bible says we're sons of God, children of God, through faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of us who have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Let's pray.